So the number one thing that motivated me to quit marijuana above all else was fear. And in this video, that's what I'm going to cover today in more detail. So I want to start off by saying that if fear is something that you're experiencing on your quitting journey, I suggest that you run with it. Use it as fuel to motivate you to quit, to get through that first month, two weeks, etc. However long you need to start to, to see the difference in reality from when you were using to when you're, you're sober. And fear can be a great motivator. It's not the most pleasant one. Of course, like in today's world, we want to hear, you know, uh, love and, and peace and joy and uh, all that and uh, friends, family. That's what we want our motive. Yeah, so that is definitely part of it as well. However, what I found was that at the root of all the motivating factors that was pushing me to quit weed, the biggest was fear. And it underlaid every single one of those motivators. So one of the main reasons I was using marijuana was for music. And that was the first motivator besides fear that drove me to quit using marijuana. So I wanted a career in music. I was pursuing it, uh, DJing, I love house music. I still listen to it today, and I find it a super beneficial and motivating part of, of my recovery in my life. And I got into music. So growing up, I was really into pop music. I, I was from a small town, we just listened to the radio, and Taylor Swift, Nicki Minaj, all that, all that stuff uh, was all we heard. So I got into college in 2012, and all the people I was chilling with, smoking weed with, uh, vibing with, they were all really into like different kinds of music. So like electronic music, dance music, and the dance music scene was starting to emerge in the US, uh, especially Big Room House, which is kind of like a mix of, of trance and club music. Uh, it's, it's really cool. It's not so hot anymore. However, in the day it was booming. And so I really got into it. I fell in love with it. And uh, a lot of the days I would, I'd be smoking, I'd be also listening to that kind of music. So I decided to drop out of school and pursue a career in dance music. And so I got the equipment, I started uh, going hard, learning everything I could. And I really thought that that was going to be my career path. I, I just felt it in my soul. And so the thing was, though, is that after a year or so, I realized I had a lot of work to do. I, I realized that this was going to take a long time. And so I wasn't making good money. So I turned to weed, I turned to dealing and, tr and using that money to pay for music equipment, uh, plugins, etc. And at the end of my using days, I was realizing, okay, Joel, if you want a, if you want a chance at this career, let's say something does pop off. Well, you see it all the time, right? In like sports, sports especially, uh, acting, where someone finally, finally hits the the career, the dream, their goal they want, and this is where the fear comes in. Uh, my biggest fear was that I was going to finally reach the pinnacle of my success uh, with all the work I put in the music, and finally be on the main stage DJing in front of thousands of people. And because of my weed use. I was gonna blow it. I was gonna, I was gonna have too much anxiety. I was gonna be have too much underlying depression, uh, or I would do something like kind of messed up and and totally just ruin the opportunity I had uh, in this in this career. So the fear of that happening was a big motivator of why I quit using, and I just wanted to make sure that I had my head on straight. Now, did the music career work out? No, it didn't. <laughs> However, uh, I, I don't think without it, I might not have quit using marijuana or drinking alcohol. So I really am thankful for it, even though it didn't work out. And this is a motivating fear that could, could actually really play in your favor. That fear of actually having the success, with relationships, et cetera, whatever you want in your life and having it ruined because of, of the use. I mean, you see it, you, you don't see it like maybe so much correlated with we use in like the NFL, for example, but I see so many examples of these guys that, that, that are the stars of the show. They break into the, the, the NFL and a year later, they're just like, you know, they're sitting on the bench or for example, like Johnny Menzel really got involved in alcohol and probably drugs as well. And his career is over. Uh, or you see guys like, um, the guy who plays for the jets, uh, whatever his name is, uh, he was not emotionally, uh, developed enough to hold his position and and his team stopped liking him which is which is kind of devastating because he's he's obviously worked really hard to get to the nfl but because he had he didn't have the emotional maturity he was unable to 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 stay in the pocket and so that was a huge motivator for me i did not want to be on the stage on like in my prime and then just lose it because uh, of a weed so the second thing that motivated me was relationships and I'm, let me tell you i had <laughs> i had pretty bad relationships uh they were with other people that use we were lying stealing doing stupid stuff and uh, I, I really didn't have uh, a great core network of people that 
I was being motivated by, and then in turn, I could motivate them. We were all just kind of a bunch of, a bunch of bums and Hey, you know, it's, it's what it was. It's a, it's, it's no knock on them. Uh, and it's no knock on me. It's where we were. It's what happened. And there's this saying, it's called your vibe attracts your tribe. And I think this is a really important saying to, to kind of internalize because ultimately we become like the people we surround ourselves with. And in turn, we attract the people that were like. So uh, when I was using and sell, smoking weed all the time, I was only attracting people that were smoking weed. And in terms of relationships, I really wanted to have relationships, intimate relationships, uh, romantic relationships. And I had so much damn anxiety <laughs> and so much depression that there was no way I was going to be able to uh, even talk to a girl in the street or let alone hold down a relationship. But even getting in the door, I, I knew it was just impossible. And I had so much work to do. So the fear of being 50 years from there, still single, never having experienced uh, love on like a true deep level with someone I cared about was a huge fear. And I'm like, shit, if I don't get my shit together, I don't know what that looks like, but I know that where I'm at now is not going to uh, attract the kind of woman uh, that I wanted to attract. And I mean, this can go vice versa, man, man whatever. <laughs> We're not going to get into that. But whoever you're attracted to, it was important to recognize that in order for me to have relationships in the future, I needed to quit weed. So that was a huge motivator factor. And the fear as well, the fear of never having... Uh, never getting to meet someone or never being emotionally mature enough or just mature enough in general to attract someone that I'm really into. So, so the next motivating factor was exercise and fitness. And I was not eating very well. I was not exercising regularly. I was not taking great care of myself. Uh, I would eat a lot of McDonald's. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of McDonald's, a lot of, a lot of uh, cookies, Oreos, donuts. I loved donuts. And I'm like a skinny guy and I have high metabolism. So lucky for me, I didn't get fat or anything. However, in any other body with any other metabolism, I would have swelled up like a balloon. And I was, I was a skinny fat, you could say. So I knew that, hey, if I want to have a great life down the line, I have to get my health in check. And so that was a big fear as well, because uh, and this plays into the relationship one where I was like, if I'm not uh, at my at a high physical condition, if I'm not taking care of myself, I'm not going to be able to attract someone that is also in peak physical condition taking care of themselves. They're just not going to want anything to do with me because, again, our vibe attracts our tribe. And the fear, the fear of leaving this world early because I didn't take care of myself, looking back at my life 20, 30 years from now and being like, damn, dude, I wish I would have just gotten taking care of myself. I wish I would have just started eating healthy instead of uh, going to Burger King every night. Like, damn it. Why didn't I do that? So that leads into the next one, which is the fear of regret. And this was, might've been the biggest one. Regret is, in my opinion, one of the most painful emotions that I've ever experienced. I think a human can experience because you can't go back and change it. it it's done. It's set in stone. And so, uh, and there's been a lot of experiences in my life where I left feeling a lot of regret. I'm not going to lie to you. Where I was like, why in the hell did I do that? Example, selling weed. Uh, example, certain relationships. Uh, and it was just like, man, I hate that feeling so much. Even to this day, if I do something and I regret it, it stings and I have to spend a couple of days like like processing through it. Uh, that Thankfully, because I, I'm sober, I don't have as many regretful days. Uh, they still come up though. So uh, in, in the context of when I was getting clean six years ago, it was, I, I was so afraid of, I was so afraid of looking back at my life with regret. And I knew that uh, the, the kindest thing I could do for myself, the most loving thing I could do for myself would was set myself up to potentially experience as little regret as possible. So I'm super thankful for that. And I want to touch back on the fitness one and the exercise and the diet one, because I think another factor that was a part of that, you know, spiel of things was the fear of dying. And I knew that if, if I were to live a long life, if I was to be blessed by, to, to make it through the next 30, 40 years, eating well would really prolong the amount of life I get to live. And I'm not going to lie to you. I like iPhones. I like technology. <laughs> and uh, the thought of not getting to experience, you know, the iPhone 300 because uh, I didn't choose to take care of myself 40 years before that was kind of kind of like uncomfortable. And I, I kind of felt some fear around it. I want to see the, the coolest MacBook. I want to live as long as I can to see as many cool things as I can. So the fear of death was a huge motivating factor as well. Now, the final fear here, and this one was 
really tied into the marijuana was going to jail, going to prison, having been murdered. And, and I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. So like I told you, I was selling weed. I was, I was dealing dope. And I got into a situation where I was kind of wrapped up with some folks uh, that didn't really like me that much. And so one day they broke into my house was out while I was gone. And they took about, I think about eight grand in terms of cash, weed. They took a couple pounds, an ounce of dabs, all gone. And just like a really nice backpack too. So I lost a nice backpack. Gosh darn it. <laughs> and uh, we'll let the backpack go. But it was a real wake up because I'm like, holy shit, this is, this is no joke anymore. This is not just fun selling weed, making a few bucks here and there, getting to buy whatever I want, smoke whatever I want. I was in real shit. And my dealer, he was like, all right, man, uh, you got to get this or we got to, I got to bring some, some boys up from Chicago to take care of this. And I was like, are you fucking, this is not happening right now. Are you kidding me? So the fear I felt in those days, I don't think I've ever felt more fear than in those like three, four days. It was just like just pure anxiety, just coursing through my body. And uh, of course it's my fault. So this is not a complaint or anything. Like I totally was a hundred percent responsible for this. Uh, and it was like, oh my, it's like I, I cringe looking back at the, that decision. <laughs> so what happened though is that we thought we knew who took it. So my buddies and I were like, all right, we got to go confront this dude. And so one guy got a gun and I was like, fuck, what happens if this guy who we think took it? And I was like, shit, what happens if the guy we thought took it didn't take it? Who's he going to come retaliate after? after we hold him up or, or kick his ass or whatever, he's coming back after me. And I was, I just saw the line. I just saw the, the trajectory of where things were going. And I did not want to live in fear for the next few years, having to constantly look over my shoulder, waiting for this guy to pop out of uh, some, some car that rolls up and just like whoop my ass or even worse, put a bullet in my head. So I'm like, uh, I talked to my dealer. I'm like, Hey man, we both done some shit. What's the chance I can just pay you back. Uh, I'll, I'll, I promise I'll bust ass and pay you back. And he's like, all right, man, we can do that. Thankfully, he knew somebody that I was friends with. So we kind of had a bit of connection there. Thank God. If he was just some other random guy, I don't know if that would have gone down. So shout out to him. And basically what happened was that from there on, I would go and we meet at a donut shop every week. I was doing delivery jobs and I, I would make about I don't know, $1,000 a week. I put 200 in the bank and take 800 bucks, put it buy two donuts, eat one, put the other, the 800 bucks in a bag and give it to him. So he got a donut and $800 every week. And, and I paid them all off, uh, thankfully. And, and I also want to say my parents helped me out. They, they loaned me some money to, to kind of calm the storm. So to, to put the smoke out a little bit. So I paid him that four grand. And then from there, for the next few years, I spent paying off my parents and uh, I'm super thankful for them for, for doing that. And, uh, that was a big motivator as well to, to get on better terms with my parents because ask, asking them for four grand for doing for lying and stealing and selling drugs, uh, it's it's not a great way to kick off a relationship. So thankfully they were forgiving. Uh, thankfully I paid them all back and now we, we have a much different relationship and uh, I'm never doing that shit again. Let me tell you that. So the fear of yeah the fear of death was was really eminent. And so the final part of this was that the last night I smoked weed I was at like a, the Arboretum it's called. And I was using the Wi-Fi from the building because I was still connected to it through through the UW. And I got a cop came and he's like, hey man, you can't be here. I'm going to write you a warning. So he writes me the warning. And I'm like, oh, got away with another one. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> and this was after I got robbed. So I was still dealing and still uh, smoking weed. So that's how crazy addiction is. I, I still didn't learn my lesson. And so here I am being a dumbass, <laughs> smoking, and uh, thankfully, thank God, I didn't have pounds or ounces it with me. I had literally a bowl, a grinder, some hemp wick, and a lighter, and that was it. And uh, I got a $360 ticket for it. Before I got that ticket, though, what happened was the, the cop came back. He's like, all right, man, here's your warning. Again, you can't come back anymore after 10 o'clock, whatever. Uh, and he turns to walk away, and he goes, is that weed? <laughs> I'm like, that's it. I like threw my hands up in that moment. I'm like, I cannot get away with any more bullshit. I've been getting away with bullshit my whole life. Uh, I'm done. And in that few moments, like 10 minutes where he was going to write the ticket, because as you know, cops take a while to write tickets. I felt so much fear. I was paranoid as shit. I'm like, oh my gosh, he knows I'm dealing. He's going to 
he's going to bring more cops and they're going to search my house, which is obviously illogical, but that's just what I was going through in my mind. And so I was like deleting numbers, like deleting, <laughs> deleting text messages. And uh, I just remember thinking like, if I can get out of this one, that I, nothing after that, just if I can get af- out of this one, he comes back, gives me the ticket, drives away. And in that moment, I realized that I was out of strikes. I was out of, out of lives. Uh, I've been fucking around for too much. And the universe was like, hey, this is it, man. This is your last warning. Next time, you're, you're going to get in some serious trouble, some real serious trouble. Uh, whether that's true or not, I'll never know. Uh, but that fear, again, back to the whole premise of this video, that fear drove me to finally quit using. And that was the last night I smoked. And so August 13th, 2016, uh, no, August 12th, 2016 was when that happened. August 13th, I woke up clean and sober and it's been clean ever since. So guys, what are some of your motivating factors that have helped you quit weed, that are helping you quit weed, or that you think might be a benefit in quitting weed? Comment what you think below and, and maybe how fear has also played a role because because fear is something that we don't really want to discuss. Uh, it's a, a bit of a taboo thing because it's scary. It's uncomfortable to talk about. However, it brings so much freedom once it can be faced. And if you are interested or on the path to quitting marijuana, then I invite you to watch this video that'll give you some tips and tricks on how to quit marijuana. Peace.